In memory of the Avengers, we're going to show you how to print, paint, gloss, and pose your figures to a whole new level of cool. But first, this is your Geek Fix. I wanted to build a big Avengers memorial, and that meant first having to have big Avengers figures. So, let's go. These are one four scale NECA figures. And as you can see, they're huge. Uh, as a reference, I am six feet tall, making them comparative giants. Literally statue sized. So why did I pick NECA? Why didn't I pick Hot Toys? First, Hot Toys has not yet made all of the uh, Avenger toys in one four scale. So that's not even a possibility yet. The other has to do with cost. I, for the price of all five of these NECA figures, I would have been able to only afford one Hot Toys figure. So there you go. However, NECA definitely has its shortcomings from weird head sculpts to posability problems. So today we're gonna to use some tweaks that we used to upgrade any figure uh, to be more realistic and cool. One common complaint about the NECA figures is their head sculpt. I mean, don't get me wrong, uh, NECA, if you haven't seen the 1-4 scale toys, they are amazing. I mean, they have a lot of detail. I mean, they come in big boxes with a lot of accessories, usually. And sometimes they pay off and you get amazing sculpts like this. The battle damage Tony Stark on the other hand looks like he's terrified, I don't know. My first goal when I got the Mark 42 was that I wanted for the mask to be able to open or for the face to be revealed. I think the faces are part of what makes them look so realistic and human. But the helmet that came with the Mark 42 didn't work out. I went online to try and find a head with a helmet and the 1-4 scale and all I could find was a head sculpt without the helmet. So that meant that I had to make my own and uh, that meant probably 3D printing a head sculpt. Now before I go any farther, I want you to know that you don't have to have your own 3D printer to be able to print 3D objects. Uh, you can go to a lot of places these days. There's a lot of uh, maker places. In fact, um, I'm in a rural community and at my library alone, there's several 3D printers. And all you have to do is just provide the uh, PLA or to pay the cost of the print. I found a great mask and helmet by me, President, day uh, but it was one-to-one -one scale and that means it was too big unfortunately when it comes to 3d models you can't just scale something down uh, you have to do a lot of trial and error because they don't just fit at that point they're they're kind of set for the size you can't just type in uh, that you wanted it 50% for example you'll find that the two parts no longer fit together so that meant that there's a lot of trial and error uh, once when I created the helmet then I had to figure out where the mask would fit I used Cura and Matter Control and uh, printed in Hatchbox wood my settings uh, were at solid and I set the size to 41 millimeters, uh, which is about 1.61 inches wide. And I stuck with the default settings and found that that worked pretty well. Sure, you can keep messing around with the temperature and the lines, but this should work just fine without doing any of that. Now, I got this great head sculpt. I mean, it looks just like uh, Robert Downey Jr. The problem was that uh, it had a very stiff neck and also it uh, wouldn't fit inside my uh, inside of my helmet very well so that meant I needed to do some surgery and so I cut the uh, head sculpt and this is where you're gonna have to have some guts uh, I cut the head sculpt from here on down uh, to the ears and then back around uh, just exposing the area that would be exposed in the mask now, if I had kept the whole head sculpt, it could have still made it work. The key would have been taking the plug from the bottom of my original head to the figure and uh, popping that in uh, because they would fit. So you have to take out the old one, put the new one in. I had to use the plug to be able to uh, 
put in the bottom of my helmet so that now uh, Tony can actually bend at his neck, which he couldn't do before. Then I, I put it in and they fit really well. I also removed the top of the helmet so that I'd have enough room to uh, access the back, uh, put in lighting, batteries, and also put the face in the front. No matter how rough your print is, there's a lot of ways to smooth out those 3D parts. Some methods like resins are a little bit more complicated and messy and sticky. If you feel comfortable with it, great. I actually tried uh, using some resin in this case. I mixed it wrong and it became very permanently sticky. So I uh, had to switch helmets. It's still sticky even today. However, I find that generally speaking, just sand and primer goes a really, really long ways. Particularly if you wanna use something like fine surface primer, it's really good at being able to fill up those gaps and you can sand it. But I found that you can pretty much sand any type of primer. Some other things I used were moldable glue, sanding sticks, and cement glue. The moldable glue is like putty. It dries hard and it's almost like plastic afterwards. I used it for closing some of the gaps as well as creating the padding for the helmet. After that, using gray and black primers are kind of preferred when you're gonna be using paints like I used. Just sand and paint and sand and paint until it looks smooth and you're ready for that final coat. Now we can spray the colors. I tried to use car sprays that uh, match the Iron Man helmet. It had the same type of speckle inside as the figure itself. So it was the closest I could come to matching. I think the exact match would actually be a dark cherry, but uh, they didn't have that available in my area. So I went with a slightly different color instead and it still came out pretty good. After a few coats, uh, we can paint the gold and the black details. I supported my helmet initially using a pop bottle, but eventually I, uh, I got these. These things are really cool. I get them uh, from the dollar store and uh, they're just reading lamps, as you can see. And at the top you have a light, which is great if you like lights. And uh, I just screw those off. And then I'm left with this very articulatable uh, arm that is connected, whoops, <laughs> that is connected to this clamp. And uh, I can use more than one. They can be used to support something in the center. I think they are one of the favorite things I have uh, found. And on top of that, we also have this light that now I could use for lighting up the eyes of my Iron Man. Now we can use the same gold that we used on the helmet uh, for the mask. Now I hope you kept the original mask because these eyes are interchangeable. They'll fit in the mask that we just printed. How cool is that? Now, as I mentioned earlier, this reading light is actually uh, kind of a perfect fit. Um, if you take it apart, you'll see that there's two LED lights and that we have a set of batteries and a switch that will all fit perfectly into the back of my Iron Man. But you can use all sorts of LEDs really uh, as long as you have some type of battery system. And if you do put the batteries in the back of the head, you can have the wires come out along the sides of the face and have connectors, uh, connecting plates on the other side, which when they make contact would of course power the LEDs and the mask and make it work. And we were able to do that. But, unfortunately, uh, the way that I designed it, I needed magnets. I needed a lot of magnets uh, to do the other things I thought were more important than the eyes. I'm not turning on the eyes very often. But the, uh, the mask needed to be able to to stick on where I wanted it to. Uh, the helmet needed to be able to be removed and put back on just in case I did want to do something with it. And unfortunately, the way that I put it together, it just used up too much space and I ended up having you know, too many magnets in the back. So, this is a project that I'm working on right now. This is the Mark II faceplate by DeDave. 
and uh, it's actually based on a uh, mask by Mi Presidente. Now what's cool about this Iron Man mask is that I printed it in iron. That's right, this is actual iron Iron Man mask. I printed this using iron PLA that's made by protopasta and so it has actual iron filament in it and therefore is magnetic. And so I think if I would have made my other mask uh, using the same material, I probably could have avoided using so many magnets, but live and learn. In the process of trying to make Tony's head fit exactly into the helmet, and I was shaving it down, and it slipped, and I ended up cutting and, and actually uh, shaving off a large portion of his eyebrow area, and also a little bit over here, and just removed the paint, basically. So that meant I needed to go back and, and fix it, but that's not a problem. You're gonna be able to do that just fine. Don't freak out if you scratch your your figure or, or if you you'd make some attempt to paint it and, and it goes wrong or something gets glued or whatever. We can still fix it. It's fixable. So just relax, eat a snack, you know, go watch a show. Uh, come back to it a little bit later on. This is something that you can fix. Now in my case, I just used oil color pencils. It matched up, it seemed to look perfect, uh, it didn't take much effort, and uh, I popped it into the helmet and uh, he was good to go. Now I did fix a couple of additional details. Uh, his hands, for example, have uh, areas in between at the joints that have to be black. They're supposed to be black, they're red in the NECA version that you get out of box. So I just used an oil marker and colored in those areas. It was really no big deal. One common problem which I've heard about in relation to this uh, Mark 42 is that they have these ties that come in around the uh, head area and they rub up against the paint. And so by the time you get them, it looks commonly like all the, all, uh, everyone I've seen has had a worn off paint that goes along this area. But again, don't worry about it. Uh, using the same paints that we use to make the helmet, uh, the gold and the uh, cherry, we're going to just touch it up, just a little touch up, and it's, it's just a little something to uh, cover it up. It seemed to work fine. Another thing you could do is you could take some hydrogen peroxide and see if that will also just melt that across. So this brings us to the head sculpts of the other figures. And the problem is, like I mentioned earlier, that while some are really, really nice and really realistic, others are less than, than realistic. And quite frankly, a little weird. Why would you want this one? I don't know. The key is they don't look like skin. They look like plastic or like a toy. This is where painting and gloss goes a long way. First of all, you'll notice that we're using about every medium possible from oils to pastels to chalk. We will be using them in multiple and very messy ways and that's why I also use something like this. Uh, in this case, I'm using some foam board. The great thing about foam board is that it will allow me to paint on top of it and it doesn't typically seep through. Also, it's very good medium for testing different types of paint on as long as it's not spray paint. Uh, bad experience with that, but at any rate. We'll start with the eyes. This way we can use the gloss very early in the process to protect them. I like to use red and pink pencils on the inside and at the top of the eyelids. I also like to use the tip of the red and just drill it into the corners. And now we're ready for our gloss. My gloss has a bit of yellow and that is not a bad thing. It's uh, actually more like real eyes would have. So you're gonna have a little bit of that yellowing to get near the back combined with some of that red. Really looks pretty much like a real eye. And uh, when we put it on there just right, the reflection from that eyeball will instantly make it look more human. Make sure you get a really small and good detailing brush. 
Unless you want it to permanently cry, make sure you leave the figure on its back so that it'll dry into those areas. It usually takes a couple of coats to make it look really good. When the gloss is dry, we're gonna scratch the areas like the eyebrows, anywhere that has hair. And if, if they have a goatee, for example, you wanna be scratching along portions of that goatee. It just makes it look a little less perfect. Uh, we want some of those imperfections in there, particularly before we start applying some of our paint process. Next, I tend to use primary pencils first. Uh, that's how I actually fix the Tony Stark head. However, you can use paints in the same way. Just make sure that you wipe it off before it fully sets. The idea is to start with the light tints first. And so we're, we're coloring in those light tints, those mild shades, and then we're going back and wiping it off. Basically, we're looking to see what sticks and we're looking for things to fill cracks that makes them uh, accentuate those details. Just continue applying those colors and then wiping them off. Once when you feel like it has a pretty good look to it, go on to the next color, usually a darker color, and then the next shade, and so on, doing the same process. Once you have the skin where you want it, we can start adding other imperfections like freckles or, or scars. The best method for this that's used by the, the biggest companies, including uh, Hot Toys, is uh, involving nothing more than a simple toothbrush. So you take the toothbrush with a little bit of wetness to it, and uh, now we're gonna apply it to some of the paints and the powders that we've already been using. And then, rub your finger across the bristles in front of a piece of paper to verify how much you want to show. Once you're ready, perform the same technique on the figure's face. You can use a lot like I did on the Captain America figure. Or you can use very little like I did on the Thor figure. Uh, you can also do the same on the arms. This is actually a technique that's also used on models to make it look like there's smaller details that your eyes can't pick up. And when you're not right up to it, it, it looks very, very detailed. Key to making this really work though is going through and having at least a few different colors of splatter that you're using. So a light color from, from the spectrum that we were using, a uh, middle color, and then a darker color. And uh, we do each of those once at least to get that realistic effect. The Thor figure's a little wide. Uh, I guess he must be endgame Thor. I don't know. <laughs> he's, he's a little big and it just looks strange to me. I really wanted to change that and the best way of changing that was using standard makeup and uh, dress techniques. So that meant shading on the sides to make the head look more thin and to have more shadows. And then at the same time, pulling in the hair more to uh, frame it in a different way. For hair, it's really the same technique. We're using darks and lights uh, and wiping them off, uh, which just leaves inside the grooves all these additional details and tones that weren't there before. So instead of getting a solid uh, plastic look, we'll have something that has some real life to it. Afterwards, I sprayed them with a flat mat uh, to be able to seal in those paints. At the same time, even when it's flat, you'll notice it still has a little shimmer or glossiness to it. So next, I used a powder I made from similar color chalk and pastels and placed them on the face like applying makeup and then just wipe it off with a dry rag. This is actually one of my favorite parts because you can so instantly see the difference in the skin tone. In fact, I'd recommend taking before and after pictures just so you can really believe how much of a change you really made in that character. On to the next big problem with the NECA figures, uh, posing. I want to pose my figures permanently. I want to make them uh, look like statues, like I said. But the problem is that NECA figures are kind of famous for having poor posability. Uh, the reason is because they have one or two things which occur, and this isn't unique to just to just NECA figures. You can see it in any figure. But there's one or two things you'll see. One is that the joint is too stiff. 
So I go to turn it and it just doesn't want to do it and it feels like it might pop or, or I'm going to break it. Uh, is one thing that can occur and on the other hand you get those joints that no matter what even though you move them into place they just drop there's nothing that is uh, solidly holding them into place and so what do you do uh, how, how can you make them where they're going to be more stiff or, or where they're going to be more uh, rigid so there are a few things that can be done if you have a NECA figure that has the stiff arms, the ones that won't move, right? You have some of those figures probably all over the house. Go grab some of those figures because the easiest way to fix it, one of the first easy ways to fix it, is using something like this. This is a heat gun. I could just use a blow dryer if I wanted to for long enough. I do want to be careful not to make it too hot, but the idea is that we're trying to expand that joint so that uh, it, it will become easier to move. And you want to be moving it as you're heating it up. And if you see that it gets more and more flexible and it's more and more willing to give, uh, that might be the point to stop with it. But it will make that joint a little bit looser. On the flip side, let's say that you have a joint that uh, doesn't want to stay up, uh, right? No matter what you do, it just continually wants to stay down, uh, you know, and fall. Uh, I hear this a lot about the Hulk figure that is available through NECA Toys. It has huge hands, they're almost the size of my hands, and yet uh, has arms that that have to be able to hold it up and it because it doesn't lock they usually want to go down like this so the key is this if you can remove the arm if you can actually expose the joint then we want to be able to put on one of a couple things uh, that that seem to work one of them would be something that you naturally might have sitting around the house which is just some uh, cement glue uh, putting a little bit of that on and letting it dry for the night. Make sure it's completely dry before the next and before you put back on the uh, arm or whatever it is. Um, it could work very well because you just expanded the amount of uh, area that is on that joint. And uh, you can do the same thing also with fingernail polish. You can also use certain forms of floor polish. Either way, it all works. Once when it's dried, it's expanded the space on that joint, and when you go to pop on something else, it seems to fit and it's more rigid now. On the flip side, you can't always get into the joints. In fact, uh, there's some joints like the ones on Tony Stark's knee right there uh, that prevent it from having any space to get into and you can't take it off or take it apart uh, but what we found is that you can take things like that floor polish and using a dropper and maybe something to just space it just slightly to try and get it inside you can make those drops in there and then uh, and move that joint back and forth to let it go inside and then you just wipe it off the excess don't worry about it uh, it should come right off it shouldn't ruin them too much. And even if it did, uh, we've got paint that will just touch that right back up. So that's what you do if you want them to just have a little bit more stiffness or if you want them to be a little bit more loose so you can get them into certain poses. But what about putting them into that pose forever or maybe even a complicated pose that you know it can't technically hold. It would have to be held down somehow. Uh, that's exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to create a statue. Once again, I wanted to create a base and, and have all my figures affixed to that base. So I got a 23 by 15 and a half inch um, shelf, I guess it is. Got it at a hardware store. I sprayed it with bright silver on the sides and granite texture spray on the top. I also glued a couple of 3D logos on the uh, base. Now, what is cool about these, I mean, they are made to be held stationary. They are made uh, to be able to be placed onto some type of stand. Uh, just like any other action figure, they have holes in the backs of their feet. And uh, for the size of the 1 4 scale, uh, that hole is a quarter inch. So that meant uh, that um, I could just use something that was a quarter inch to make them stand. Technically true. Technically. Uh, but 
don't plan on that working because these quarter inch holes are too short. They barely just go into the foot, just barely enough uh, to maybe get something in there, but it doesn't help them to stand. In fact, it might pop off the bottom of their foot. So for that reason, it's better to get a drill and get a quarter inch bit and to carefully, when you get it into the pose that you want, drill through that hole and uh, up a little bit higher where you feel safe that you can go and uh, and then using a machine screw that is also a quarter inch I was able to screw through the bottom of my base and into the foot and leg of my individual figures and lock them into space I can literally pick up this whole thing and just carry it away uh, to somewhere if I wanted to also, don't forget to use something like padding stickers on the bottom of that board so that uh, the nails uh, don't accidentally scratch the top of your table. Uh, so mine has a bunch of padding screws all around it, lifting it up high enough that the uh, screws would never touch the bottom. I will say too, you have to be really careful with those machine screws when you're tightening them. Uh, for some of them, their feet actually have a plate that is separate and it will separate that foot when you tighten it too much. And that's what happened for me. Uh, Iron Man's foot, the bottom, is actually a separate piece. And so when I tightened it enough, it just popped off that bottom foot. And so I had to glue it using hot glue and then I screwed into it and it seems to work fine. Spider-Man was really my last figure to arrive. I had a few ideas of what I thought I could do with them, but in the end, I saw this 4th of July flag with the ball on top and I had this vision. I painted the post in silver and the ball in gold. Then I used a drill bit the same size as the pole to drill an equal hole in Spidey's hand. So now his hand could be stuck onto the pole and on top of that I put the ball. But this is still not enough to really keep Spidey from uh, breaking uh, because now his full weight is being pulled away. And so I did put some glue up here in the wrist and then I also uh, supported his back. This Spider-Man comes pre-made with a hidden uh, screw hole that you can hang things with. You can hang them up on the wall, you can hang them upside down or whatever. But uh, I thought, well, if I used a screw that was far enough away from the wall, I could support him even in a way that he doesn't have to actually be up against the wall. But it would also relieve that wrist. Now this is modeled after a suit that Spidey wore not just in Civil War or Homecoming, but also in Away From Home. In fact, he's wore more than one Spidey outfit in that movie. Do you know how many total Spidey outfits he wore? If you do, comment below. Now before we go any further, no, I didn't get the Hulk. I decided he was just too massive and expensive to justify it. But who knows, maybe he's right for you. Maybe he'd make the perfect finish to this. Uh, you could put him on the backside so it'd be an actual circular uh, thing. But uh, if you do have the Hulk, go ahead and, and show us what you did with him. He is huge. Remember that th these things are pretty much to scale and, and these figures are one four scale. A one four scale Hulk is ginormous. Let us know what you think in the comments. And now our Avengers are ready to strike a pose. I thought it looked a little plain at the top, so I got some red and some white poster board, and I made myself a stencil, and used it to cut out my letters in white, pasted small amounts of extra poster board just out of sight on the bottom of the letters, and pasted that onto the red board, and hung it up. Now that's a memorial I can stand by. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. These are the kinds of videos that we make. Subscribe to the channel and click on that reminder bell so you don't miss out on future videos like how we made this giant four foot diorama. Like, subscribe, and comment below. This is your Geek Fix.